associated with the name Karamak can be attributed to the exceptional individuals it has produced. Since its establishment in 1974, students have entered with their aspirations and left as rounded, well-trained professionals equipped with the knowledge to tackle their dreams with unwavering prowess. For 47 years, the Caribbean School of Media and Communication has gifted innovative minds and brilliant leaders to our society. And today we celebrate the impact of one of Karimak's most special gifts to media and communication. Through this ceremony, we honor the life of the late Professor Agri Brown, former director of Karimak and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. So it is with absolute pleasure that I welcome you wherever you are in the region and the world, to the 12th staging of the annual Karimak Agri-Brown Distinguished Lecture. I'm Simone Clark. I'm your moderator for today's program. It is my honor to be here and an even greater honor to now invite my Karimak batchmate, longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Livingston White, director of Karimak, to share his official welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. It was just like yesterday we sat in class together at the feet of Professor, the late Professor Agri Brown. Which course was it again? Communication, Communication yeah. Culture and Caribbean Society. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. MC yes. 10A. Very clearly. It that was, was like 1994. Yesterday. Do you remember your definition of development? <laughs> Put your Let's <laughs> Communication, the transference of meaning between intelligences. Yes. <laughs> you teaching me? Okay. Okay. That's right. Thank you for that, Doc. <laughs> Good to see you again, Simone. You for too. 11 years, we have successfully displayed the pride of Caramac by honoring the legacy of the late Professor Agri Brown. During his service as the director of Caramac and the dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, his impact stretched far beyond this institution. As his work paved a path, through the field of communication for many to follow. The seeds of knowledge that he planted will bear fruits for generations as brilliant minds come to the institution and leave as refined, optimized powerhouses. Agri Brown's work and vision will never die and will extend even to those who are not directly under his mentorship. His contribution to research, training, and communication is shared into the history of Karimak. We have consistently maintained the prestige for which this event is known, and this year does not deviate from the standard that we have established. This is the 12th staging of the Karimak Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture, and the third to be executed virtually. We are honored to have Professor Shaheed Nick Mohammed as this year's guest speaker. 
His dedication to the regional research that he has conducted will undoubtedly be evident in his presentation. Professor Mohammed's work has helped to advance communication scholarship in the Caribbean. The theme of today's lecture, Tales from the Field, Communication Research in and About the Caribbean, is fitting for this virtual display of regional diversity. We are indeed pleased to have our guests from the neighboring countries partake in today's lecture. And as I look in the chat on YouTube, I can see that there are colleagues from around the region, the Caribbean region, joining us right now. After enduring two years under COVID-19 restrictions, CARMAC anticipates a return to a blend of physical undergraduate production labs and online graduate classes. We are excited for the new opportunities for our students to network and participate in activities in improved learning spaces that are virtual and physical, spaces that will foster school spirit and academic growth. We acknowledge the final year students and lecturers who worked virtually to plan this year's lecture. We are grateful for all who have taken the time to be a part of this year's program. Widow of Professor Brown, Dr. Susan Francis Brown and family, specially invited guests, members of staff and students, I officially welcome you to the 12th staging of the Caramac Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. White. Um, it, is my, it is my distinct honor to refer to you as Dr. White. Um, we've had many years, even before campus days, when we were getting our feet wet, being introduced to media at the Creative Production and Training Center. And that knowledge was only expanded when we went to Caramac. Um, we can't share many of the stories from those days in this space, <laughs> but I will share with the folks online, um, whether you're here in Jamaica or around the world, that um, Dr. White, myself, uh, Dr. Donna Hope, who is still on campus, Professor Donna Hope now, um, still on campus, and Mrs. Ruth Lynn Johnson were known in our days as the Carimac Four. Um, and under the watchful eyes of mentors like Chapi Saint Just and the beloved uh, Professor Agri Brown, we were molded into our best selves while on campus. Professor Brown was a consummate professional, yes. but ever so wonderful to his students. And, and even as I speak about him, I can see his eyes crinkling. You know, I can I have a, an image of him in my mind's eye when he used to smile or laugh. His eyes would just crinkle at the corner. Um, but his wit, the breadth of his knowledge, the skill with which he imparted it, his passion, his signature cricket analogies. I mean, even if you didn't get cricket, you'd understand when he started to put it in the paradigm, put things in that paradigm for you. It allowed you to see the world in a different way. And it also allowed you to see your place in the world, telling your story and that of others who are living it. Um, I remember when I was working on my thesis with Prof. Brown as my advisor, and there were so many days when I wanted to just scream and give up after our meetings with so many corrections, copious corrections to be made. And it was very frustrating. But in the end, when I, when I got my grade, I knew exactly what Prof was doing. He was about self-actualization. He was about stretching you as far as you could be stretched to ensure that you became the best of who you could be. And for that reason, I am blessed to have met him and to have had him be an influence in my life. And I believe it is therefore very fitting for us to you know, have this lecture staged in his name. We will now remember Professor Agri Brown with a short video presentation, The Many Faces of Agri Brown.
play. Wow. <sighs> A lot of memories coming back there, folks. Let's let's keep it moving. I want to welcome anybody who's just joined us. Thank you for being here with us this evening for this very special event. We have an exciting uh, program ahead, so we're asking you to stay with us to see all we have in store. And what's an event like this without sweetening the pot a little bit, right? So we have a giveaway for you now, your chance to win a prize. I hope you're all quick with your fingers because we want you to type the answers in the chat. And then towards the end, we will tell you um, if you won and what you won. So here's your question. The first of many today. What is the name of the first year undergraduate course that Professor Agri Brown taught? I think Dr. White gave it away in his introduction, Doc. <laughs> Hope you were listening. What is the name of the first year undergraduate course that Prof. Brown taught? If you have the answer to that question then put your answer in the chat. Our chat moderators are gonna be looking for the lucky winner and please stay on to the end so we can announce the winner of this giveaway and more prizes will come. So stay tuned for that. Also sweetening the pot with some entertainment before we head on down to Prof. At this time, the talented Jamika Johnson, final year student of the UWI has a musical item for us. Let us go to the land of love, where the love light shines so bright above, where we will be so happy and free. All your pains will let you be, and you're gonna find the love. Life will be better for you and me. We will find true happiness up here. Come with me and have no fear. Yeah. And you're gonna find the love is real. Very nice. Thank you very much. Can we give Jamika a little round of applause, physical and in the chat? Well done, Jamika. Boy, I can't wait to go outside and hear Jamika um, perform. Very, very uh, captivating talent, beautiful song, beautiful voice. Thank you, Jamika, for your heartwarming performance. And it is time now for one more giveaway. So, told you we weren't stingy with the prizes. If you missed the last opportunity, this could be your chance. Here's your question. For or during what period did Professor Agri Brown serve as Dean for the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the UWI? What period did Professor Agri Brown serve as Dean for the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the UWI? In the chat, folks, is where you need to head. I hope you win something this time. And if you don't, again, don't worry. This will not be your last opportunity. Okay. And now it is time for the main act. It's time for the main event. Our guest speaker 
Shaheed Nick Mohammed is an associate professor at the Pennsylvania State University. And having been published in various scholarly journals, the impact of Professor Mohammed's work cannot be denied. Among his many contributions to media and communication are the two books that he has authored entitled Communication and the Globalization of Culture Beyond Tradition and Borders and the Disinformation Age, The Persistence of Ignorance, both very relevant today, as we all know, based on what's happening across the world. We are honored to have Professor Mohammed as this year's speaker, and we are sure that his presentation will be an enlightening one. So we welcome you, Prof, and we thank you for being here with us this evening, and we look forward to what you will impart. Over to you, sir. Thank you so very much, Simone. Uh, thanks to Caramac, thanks to Dr. White and the faculty members, thanks to the technical team. There's a, a, a crack squad of technical uh, operators going on in the background that you probably won't be able to see. Um, and thank you to, thanks to everyone who's joined us from so many places. I understand we heard from St. Kitts earlier and Trinidad is in the house and I know Canada is probably joining us. Uh, so thanks to everyone who's joined us. Uh, this is truly an honor. Um, it's my great pleasure to share with you some lessons from my approximately 30 years of conducting research in the Caribbean and further afield. Yes, it has been 30 years, Livingston, um, and I'm not gonna win that prize because I don't remember the name of the introductory course. That's how long it's been. Um, but yeah, this presentation is possible only because of the work and the achievement of those who've gone before. As Caramac and its parent institution, the University of the West Indies, push the boundaries of what it means to be a Caribbean scholar, we must remember the pioneers who got us here. The names include Winston Agri Brown, whom we honor and remember each year with this lecture. There are others, both scholars and media practitioners, without whom our field and its scholarly growth would not have been possible. The growth of Caribbean media scholarships and professional practice owes a tremendous debt to numerous pioneers. I cannot name all of them here, but permit me to big up my dear friend and mentor, the great Alma Mok Yen O.D., who helped to shape the radio industry in Jamaica. Not the least of her contributions was stewardship of the radio education unit at the Mona campus. Permit me also to remember my friend and mentor, Franklin Chappie saint Just, a giant of film and television who taught us that the camera is not an extension of your eyes, but an extension of your mind. Say these names often and with pride, for it is with respect to these great pioneers that we shall ourselves aspire to build on their foundations, to stand, as they say, on the shoulders of giants. History, said Agri Brown, is the sum total of the interactions of people and their environments. History is therefore that which we do and the tales that we tell. No longer shall we be footnotes in someone else's story. We now tell our own stories. A few such stories I hope to share this evening. Let's begin with my professional research. My journey in research started somewhat inauspiciously administering surveys to companies in Kingston for Market Research Services Limited, whose CEO just happened to be a lecturer at Caramac. Mr. Donald Anderson, some of you might have heard of him, introduced me to the world of research in the classroom, but also out on Spanish Town Road, waiting in various lobbies for someone to answer the questions on my survey sheet. For both those experiences, I am grateful. I learned that research is not some grand enterprise by which academic journals are fueled. It is also grounded in real life, in everyday experiences, and in the human condition. Once graduated, I found myself working in television news. Well, that was interesting. Chasing down a news story required all kinds of investigative research skills. Indeed, once when we followed police chasing car thieves, I realized that it also required quite some driving skills. This while tearing through gravel roads in a sugarcane field. Outside of journalism, I worked in sexual and reproductive health communication in the Caribbean during the 1990s. It was an interesting time and place to conduct research. We were concerned as always with topics like teen pregnancy and contraception, but we had some new challenges. 
chief among them, the HIV AIDS crisis. Money was coming in and external agencies were eager to get programs started, but they required solid evidence about the situation on the ground, continuous monitoring and evaluation of activities, and some indication of success when the money had been spent. In all of this, my CARMAC background in social marketing, entertainment education, development communication, and research methods came in very handy. Working with agencies such as the Caribbean Family Planning Affiliation and its affiliates throughout the region, I was privileged to organize focus groups, interviews, and other research activities to learn from Caribbean people their ideas about diverse topics, including contraception, HIV AIDS, and even their thoughts on migration. These activities included direct investigations and consultations with other researchers and experts in the field. The ideas emerging from those investigations were not exactly textbook stuff. Like during a meeting of regional researchers and experts, we learned that it was becoming at that time quite common for men of a certain age to start calculating their risks versus their time left. The math went something like this. How many years can I dodge HIV AIDS? Maybe four or five, good. Then how many years will it incubate? Plus how many years will I survive it? Another 10 maybe, right. So if I'm 50 now, that's taking me to 65 when I plan to go out anyway. So yeah, no need for your safe sex and condoms, I'm good. We call them the calculators. As a young researcher, I was privileged to work in many of the territories of the region. I either ran or participated uh, in projects in Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and Dominica. Each territory and each group had unique properties and unique lessons. For example, the lesson that we should not make assumptions about the homogeneity of Caribbean people. For all of our efforts at integration and a common Caribbean cause, we are made up of many groups with unique identifications and highly nuanced traditions. Nowhere was this more evident than when my research team visited the indigenous peoples of Dominica. We visited with the permission of one of their cultural ambassadors and groups were assembled to talk with our team about their social challenges and their attitudes to family planning and sexual health. The lead interviewer was a dramatist and community activist from another island. The questions were determined from the priorities of the funding agency and it was a disaster. After the first 15 minutes or so, the lead interviewer abruptly stopped the session, pulled me aside and said, I think we're asking the wrong questions. There were blank stares on the faces of the participants and that confirmed their suspicions. We stared at the question guides in our hands for a while until he said, "Never mind, leave it to me. He put down his question guide and went back to the group. And he said, why don't you tell me how you do, th do things around here? Slowly, they began to share details of their kinship structures, how land was handed down, how they formed pair bonds, stuff that we hadn't thought to ask them about. Elsewhere in the region, we faced different problems. Early in the 90s, it was possible to show up in a village in St. Lucia, for example, and quickly gather up a little group for a session. The community center was always a good place to start. The church and other gathering spots, bars, um, were equally fruitful. Uh, but only a few years later, it struck us that we couldn't find many people in the community center. It was after working hours, but the streets, the churches, and the liming spots were bare. What had happened? It was the same village, some of the same people, the same research team with many locals involved in the planning. The locals apologized for the poor turnout, but the explanation was not complicated cable television had reached the village. Everyone, everyone was inside watching some American television. When we did get groups to participate, our notions of punctuality were often tested. Those of us who've experienced this are familiar with how it works. Many times we'd arrive for say a five o'clock meeting, we'd arrive at the location an hour before five, we set up our recording equipment, meet with local leaders. Five o'clock would come and go. About six o'clock, we would ask our local contact people if they were sure they got the message out to the community. It would often be seven o'clock before, before a few people straggled in and maybe eight o'clock before we had a crowd. 
The lesson is that you must adjust your expectations when you're a guest in a community and people are giving you of themselves and their time to participate in their research. In St. Lucia and Dominica, along with community activists and local personnel, I was able to work with secondary school students, finding out about their families and how migration affected them. In that research, there were several cautionary tales. Like the story of one young lady who continuously boasted above her colleagues about how much stuff her mother sent her from the United States, how many sneakers she had. Until suddenly during a session, she grew quiet. And then, almost without warning, she burst into tears. She was screaming that she would give it all up just to have her mother with her. So it's important to understand what your research might mean to the people who are your informants. Later in life, I would return to some of these places to do a very different kind of research, the sort of stuff I do now. We call it media history. It's all about the reciprocal relationships between media and history. It's a great field, ably assisted by a great thing called digitization. I can log on to a database now and browse through copies of the New York Times from the 1800s, reconstruct the listening habit of early radio enthusiasts by examining radio schedules printed in daily newspapers during the 1920s. And in the region, we're not too far behind. Uh, the Jamaica Glena has started making its digital ar archives available. They've been doing that since 2005. Now they boast that you can reach back to the 1830s to examine the daily news. That's not quite the same for every newspaper in the region, and some valuable repositories and other resources are still only accessible through physical clipping files or bound volumes. This reaching into the past is a fascinating prospect when you consider that some of our territories were early adopters of media technologies and demonstrated amazing innovations. If you were a boxing fan in Guyana in the 1920s, for example, for a few shillings, you could have bought yourself what might be the first pay-per-view, well, really it was pay-per-listen, pay-per-view ticket to hear, a, to hear a world heavyweight championship fight broadcast over shortwave radio received with massive antennas on the Guyana coastline and transmitted by phone to your home. That's how cutting edge we were. What a wonderful thing it would be to follow up on such leads and investigate how we were involved in the evolution of this medium. So I asked my institution for some travel funds. I made my way down to Georgetown. My librarians made the necessary contacts with me with the local libraries, universities, and the Sir Walter Rodney archives. But let me pause here to celebrate the librarians and the archivists and all those who labor so diligently to protect and preserve our historical records. Our librarians are indeed world-class I recognize Jamaica-born Michelle Jump, who was recently chosen as the New York State Library Association Librarian of the Year, and who has struggled for representation for Caribbean people and all other minorities in the New York State school system. She did not earn that distinction lightly. She represents a tradition of respect for learning here in the region that we have developed over many years a tradition that has emerged out of our history of oppression and the knowledge on the part of many poor parents that through learning and education, our children would evolve out of the bondage of poverty. These are not small ideas. They are driving forces in our success. We must still believe that it is in knowledge of the world around us and of our own heritage and our history that our future and development are rooted. I am aware that the University of the West Indies has put some effort into developing our skills in library sciences and in archival explorations. The UE Mona Campus Department of Library and Information Studies, for example, has offered a master's degree in archives and record management. That department celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. So congratulations to them. Despite all this great work, however, much more needs to be done. And that's where we return to the Guyana National Archives, to the dusty, physical bound volumes of newspapers from more than a century ago. 
a treasure trove, but a fragile one. The staff were hesitant. Despite letters that had passed between my institution and theirs, it took some convincing for them to venture into the back rooms and emerge with the volumes. These dusty volumes had not aged well. Sometimes the very act of turning a page would result in crumbling bits and pieces. It was with some sadness that I carefully examined the dates that could be helpful to me. I didn't want to do any further damage, but I thought about the real possibility that I might be the last person to see these papers intact. The University of the West Indies has done an amazing job with limited resources over the years. I've had the privilege of spending some of my research time at the Alma Jordan Library in St. Augustine, and I practically grew up at Mona where we, back when we still had a card system. I don't know, some of you don't even know what that is. I was there shuffling around the stacks after Hurricane Gilbert when staff were trying to rescue books from water damage. These are real heroes. Today, these guardians of our heritage include librarians, archivists, digital specialists working to make our past and present indelible, portable, and accessible. Reviving faded ink on crumbling pages, faint sounds on audio recordings and flickerings of long forgotten footage. These warriors are fighting to preserve the past and document our shared and evolving heritage. To support these efforts, I call on the great and emerging commercial corporations in our region to seize the opportunity to support efforts to digitize our historical records, to create databases, and to make our history accessible to our regional researchers and on the world stage. Our governments and regional bodies such as CARICOM and UWE are of course key in such processes, but this work costs money and can perhaps only happen with the support of the commercial sector. In this regard, I also want to use this platform to issue a call to our corporate giants to partner with the University of the West Indies and Caramac to make a reality of our long-standing dream of a Caribbean communications research clearinghouse, a repository of communications research publications, maybe even data sets originating from the region or having the region as their focus Imagine the possibilities where, where students and researchers in the region could have direct and immediate access to the wealth of materials being produced and the knowledge being generated. Imagine a CARMAC graduate student having access to several data sets detailing, for example, social media habits in Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, Guyana. Imagine the possibilities. Several historical disasters have quietly befallen us already. In my research in Guyana and Trinidad, I hit several roadblocks in my search for recordings of early radio broadcasts. Many radio, television, radio and television broadcasts with many of our media pioneers have disappe they've disappeared. Some have been lost to time and poor storage conditions, but media managers also told stories of new buildings and discarded archives, sometimes with only a few documents remaining. In our efforts to modernize, we're still in the habit, it seems, of discarding the artifacts of our past, maybe because we have been taught that history belongs to others. If, as Agri Brown taught us, Simone and Livingston, myself, if, as Agri Brown taught us, and so many others, if, as Agri Brown taught us, history is the sum total of the interaction between human beings and their environments, then research is the process of articulating that history, investigating its various meanings and lessons for many years, articulating our history was something that others did on our behalf. For example, you know, who do you think wrote a major study on Jamaica radio call-in programs in the Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media? It was an American named Stuart Serlin. He was also my MA supervisor in Canada. Who do you think published the book Mass Media in the Caribbean in 1990? Mm, yep, Stu Serlin with a Swedish researcher. Now, I remember Stu Serlin fondly and list him among the greats, but still, here was someone from outside who was helping us find our voices. 
The chapters in the book, however, are written mostly by Caribbean scholars. Over the years, we have continued to produce graduates in many fields and academics in numerous areas, including communication. The University of the West Indies has embarked on initiatives to encourage and develop research and publication output. The University of the West Indies Press has continued to distinguish itself as a source of world-class scholarly publications. These efforts are evident in many different initiatives. I was honored, for example, to be invited to present at one session of Caramac's research seminar series, now a regular feature on the Caramac calendar. Our scholars are evolving into experts in their own domains and into international prominence. We are telling our own stories, conducting our own research at home and from abroad that detail our history. And this does not just mean research into the past, since we engage in the production of history every day. We're investigating our history when we research politics in the Jamaican Twitterverse, a real project in progress by a UE graduate student right now. And the spread of COVID-19 disinformation on Caribbean Facebook groups, a real project that I published last year. Challenges remain, however, among them the integration of such research into the broader fabric of society. If our research and our studies and our publications advance without being relevant to our communities and our development, then we will be doing little more than building ivory towers of our own. I therefore call on regional media as they grow, expand, and succeed to give credence and voice to our researchers report on their findings celebrate their books include them in your debates our researchers should become household names they should be cited in the press they should be referenced in the news another challenge is that of convincing our populations that the things we do are valuable useful or relevant too often average folks find the work of academic research to be incomprehensible outside of this sphere of experience. Interpreting that work to the public presents a duty for our journalists and all in the media. Making this whole business of research into a socially valued activity also involves convincing Caribbean people that they are legitimate producers of history. In an ongoing project involving research with Caribbean YouTubers, one of the major challenges that I've faced is trying to explain to potential participants what exactly I'm doing. Many of them have no idea what academic research is and why anyone would want to do it. Validating and normalizing research as a means to development is an additional task for Caribbean researchers and for our regional media, who, by the way, stand to benefit from research as news and from audience studies as well. So let's talk a little bit about the digital turn because that's changed a whole lot. There's a time when the only feasible approach to doing research in the Caribbean or about the Caribbean was to be present in the Caribbean. In a pinch, if you were interested in Caribbean communities, you might visit areas of New York City, Toronto or London. Some of you know these areas I'm talking about. That's where you go visit your family. Yes, I mean Queens and Brooklyn. Um, no, but today, Caribbean communities have footprints that are much broader, and their digital presence presents new opportunities for research. We can conduct research on both Caribbean communities and their metropolitan diasporas using the digital technologies. And I know you're thinking social media, but let's go back a little bit. When radio stations in Trinidad and Tobago turned to streaming in the early 2000s, I was right there recording streams and doing content analysis from my office in New York. Social media is there now and it allows us to observe community activities and sentiments, even if we are not there on the ground. For example, I was able to ex examine, like I said before, stories of immigration and sorry, no, I didn't mention this one before. I, I was able to examine stories of immigration and concepts of home on Caribbean Facebook, uh, the groups that Caribbean um, people form on Facebook some years ago. And then I mentioned before I did the COVID-19 disinformation um, project last year, and that was all uh, Caribbean Facebook groups as well. 
Researchers in Jamaica, as I said, are examining the political uses of Twitter and looking at how those foreign technologies are adapted to local needs. More on that later. The global reach combined with digitized archives and our current production of media artifacts enables us to document our history and to research our past and our emerging realities in a way never, never before imagined. I call on commercial media entities in the Caribbean to recognize the value of such efforts and to place this historical preservation above commercial opportunities by providing discounted or even free access to students and academic researchers who require access to their archives. And this is no theoretical proposition. I'm told that it's happening already. I'm told of the work of a Mr. Louis McLean, a Caramac graduate, who's been producing a show on TVJ called Journeys to the Past, built on archival material. I'm also aware of News Talk 93 FM's radio show called Voices from the Archives, featuring recordings from the University of the West Indies archives, such as audio recordings of public lectures and radio interviews, some of which were done by the Radio Education Unit and initially housed in the Library of the Spoken Word, an Alma Machian initiative. I don't know for sure, but there's a good chance I worked on some of those. So as we expand the scope of what we do, and as we expand our ability to conduct research across borders and even with digitized archives across time, and as we make clearer to our publics the nature of what we do as research, we must also ask ourselves about what we do as research. From our choices of research topics to our methods, there is scope for development. Some of us, see the need to compete with established and received notions of research and research approaches. A need to show that we're as good as or better than the outside world when it comes to approaches like surveys and experimental designs. This is a valuable, even essential notion. But bear in mind that even these venerated approaches, such as survey research and experimental design, are not value-free or objective even our basic textbooks in communication theory tell us that these approaches were in large part developed at the behest of forces, including the Rockefeller Foundation, who saw their value to metropolitan corporate interests. So should we ignore these approaches? Absolutely not. We should master them. And we should offer even more. It is at this point we start asking what more? What else? How else? I'm not the only one asking. In a 2018 article, Wilson et al. Have, have specifically identified the need for establishing what they termed an indigenous Caribbean research approach to research Caribbean social issues. And they encouraged us to examine Caribbean ways of knowing. This includes validating and integrating such social phenomena as liming, and old talk, and what they call culturally relevant ways of carrying out research. To end, I would like to make three suggestions for the research agenda in media and communications in the Caribbean. Number one, and this one's important, research projects to tell the history of our pioneers. We should immediately embark on projects to tell the stories of our great media pioneers, many of whom battled against prejudice and colonial notions of what media practitioners should look like and sound like. So if you're lucky enough to bump into Gary Allen, CEO of the RGR Glena Group, or in Trinidad, radio pioneer Hans Hanumansing, Ask them for an interview. The next time you see Faye Ellington at Caramac, ask her for an interview and record her recollections of her pioneering work in Jamaican media. If Don Anderson still visits Caramac, interview him as a pioneer of media research in the region as well. Call number two, research into Caribbean responses to changing media technology. From the very beginning, with each new technology, Caribbean people have always adopted and adapted media to suit their own needs. 
whether they're using Facebook groups as community notice boards or using Twitter to discuss politics, we need to describe and contextualize these uses. We need to chronicle the evolution of these adaptations and theorize their significance. Item number three, developing theory in Caribbean media communication research. Now, there's some debate as to whether we can speak of Caribbean media theory. Some people believe that we should just be like everyone else and use the same theoretical positions found in literature from outside. However, others, including Agri Brown, have suggested that our particular historical legacies and social situations demand either adaptations of prevailing theory or development of homegrown, or what he might call appropriate perspectives. While there's value in both approaches, this places upon us a dual burden. We must excel at prevailing theory and explore adaptations or novel approaches. This means that we must cite Marx and Foucault with ease, but also integrate the work of Agri Brown, or even, I hope she's here, Anthea Henderson, who has been concerned about the Caribbean's communication sector conforming to the Western model in structure and content, and who wrote, I learned diffusion theory, but rejected the triumphalism undergirding its embrace. I hope these few thoughts have some value to the young and upcoming researchers in our audience. I hope that maybe I've provoked some nostalgia and optimism in some of our more seasoned practitioners. I also hope that the calls I've made for supporting research into our own culture and our own society fall on fertile ground. Our history will be written by us. No longer do we depend on others to tell our story. We are now the creators of the content, the architects of the approach, and the masters of the meaning, and may I say, maybe even the meaning of meaning. That day is here when the mantle of telling our story falls to us and not to others. Go brave, you warriors of learning. Walk good. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Prof. You make me want to go back to school. I mean, <laughs> Dr. White, those discussions about the PhD may be necessary after all. Very, very. <laughs> no, your, your, your presentation, Prof, is so thought provoking. And so many questions to answer and so much to chew on, but the charges, you know, about historical preservation and finding our own voice and telling our own story and you know not having the narrative be written for us from external sources and seeing ourselves as legitimate voices of history that's powerful that's powerful importance of research topics methods and develop those and the suggestions you know about um the pioneers of our of our of our media landscape so key sometimes we forget just how pioneering they have been and we take it for granted you know as we do so many other things in this country and this region until it gets external validation um you know so very important and i'm looking at some of the comments um in the youtube chat and so many people are agreeing with you um absolutely the work of the uwi archives goes on on recognized hi here here to them Hello, Dr. Susan Francis. Susan Francis Brown is on. Good. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? It's been so long. It says big ups to the UA archives and to their early leader, Amma Mokin. Uh, Alika Campbell saying global north models do not always coincide with the Caribbean reality. Wow, wow, love the real life example. Says share, share. I could identify with names being called. One example, Faye Ellington. And Anthea Henderson, famous, apparently. 
Yes, I agree. We should definitely be interviewing and archiving the perspectives of our current pioneers and luminaries, troves of wisdom there. I concur fully. Um, if you folks were listening and there's a question that is in your mind to ask our prof, we ask you to head to the chat now. Prof, I have some questions here for you, but I'm going to follow the program as I've been given because I don't want to be fired off the little work. Um, and then we get to the Q&A. So if you have a question, post it in the chat now. We have a couple of minutes with Prof in a, in a little while for him to answer some of those questions that this presentation ha has evolved. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed. We're grateful for your attendance at this lecture. We are grateful for the wisdom you have imparted and for the charges you have given and for us as current and body media practitioners, I really hope we take them to heart and head in the direction that you have um, charged us to do. It's really very okay. important. Okay, so in addition to the points of wisdom that Prof has left for us, um, we're gonna leave you with something now, if you're able to answer this giveaway question. In which Caribbean island, and Prof, you can't give any hints, was Professor Shaheed Nick Mohammed born? Prof, nothing from you. Head to the chat again. Our winners will be announced at the end. Of I'll the just, program. I'll just not talk then. Thank you. Appreciate that. Your <laughs> time to talk is coming up right now. So, thank you, Tony Ann, for sending some of these questions that have come up in the chat. Um, Prof, the first one is: um, Were there any ethical issues encountered during any of the research activities undertaken in the Caribbean? And if yes, what were some of them, and how did you handle those? Honestly, back then, um, it was kind of the Wild West mm -hmm. in that we didn't have strong um, human subjects boards and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of times we could get by with just clearing it with the you know various agencies we were working with or the funding agencies. Um, so yeah, back then it was it was a lot easier than it is nowadays. That's not necessarily a good thing. Um, it is good to have the uh, human subjects overview and to make sure that research is conducted ethically. But no, we did not generally face a lot of problems back then, especially in sort of um, field research for you know non-governmental agencies and that sort of stuff. We, we didn't encounter a lot of problems. We did have obstacles and they didn't have to do with ethics boards which i know you know if you're into research these days that's sort of the bane of your existence but um we we did have um issues with uh groups and communities on some of the islands um there was one time and i got to be real careful how i tell this story i was not there um but i am told that there was one time when a group of our researchers who were doing family planning, contraceptive kinds of, you know, just asking people about their knowledge and their habits. They were escorted off one of the islands. They were sent to the airport and told to leave because certain certain people in the community didn't didn't think that that was an appropriate uh, topic of discussion. So we did face that. Now, I, I doubt that that would happen now. I mean, it, things have changed that much now. But yeah, there were there were challenges. There were barriers, like I, I, I spoke about in the presentation. Um, just at some points, we lost audiences. We lost audiences to cable television. You know, imagine now, I, I don't know what it would be like now. Now, I sort of cheat by just going online and just trolling people on Facebook. That's what I do now. But if I went out to that community center in St. Lucia, I don't know if anybody would be there anymore. You know, things have changed. They've really changed over these, you know, 30 years I've been doing this. And it's interesting for the young people, the people who are just starting, who face different kinds of challenges now. They have all the digital archives and they have all the tools and all the technology, but now they've got to compete with foreign theoretical perspectives. They've got to be in line with the ethics boards. And these are important things. These are definitely important things that they skills that they have to know. And as we graduate more people, and I, I, I didn't mention in, in my presentation, you know, some of the some of the people who've graduated who are just making waves all over the region, just and forget the rest of you, we just stay with Caramac here, you know, Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle, who was at one point dean of one of the schools over at UT, uh, at UTech, um, 
I, I was going to mention in the speech, I forgot, um, at Nallis in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, um, Roma Wangsang, who was with you guys in, in at Caramac as well. She's doing great work out there trying to get the archives digitized. And so we, we are at, I think, a crossroads where our people are able, they have the tools, they have the wherewithal now to, to make this transition into telling our history, being our history, expressing our identity in that research and in, in, in changing our region for the better. Which is a challenge in itself, eh, Prof, because one thing is, I guess one extreme is a lack of information you have to dig. The other is, is a dearth of it um, or a wealth of it, I should say. So you have to really kind of look through and sift through to find what is, what is true, what is reputable, which is reliable. Yes. And, and so you mentioned one of my books about disinformation, which actually was, was written actually a couple of years ago. So it's, it's, things weren't as bad as they are now. Things were not as bad then as they are now. It's 10 times worse now in terms of disinformation. Um, we, we have all of those challenges. We have all of those challenges, but I, I, I really am optimistic about what's happening in our region. When uh, Dr. White invited me to the, to the Caramac Research Seminar, for example, amazing stuff. I mean, I sat in on a couple of them, just not just the one I did, I sat in on a couple. The, the students are coming up with amazing projects. They are getting just substantial support and advice. And what we're doing is really, really important. I think we should not underestimate the importance, the value of what the University of the West Indies and Caramac are achieving um, through their, their programs right now. Absolutely fantastic. We should be very proud. A very engaging lecture, says Auntie Faye. Faye Ellington is online with us. Hello, Faye. And Patrick Prendergast says, absolutely, a research agenda to be supported. Shahid hits the mark. Be not afraid, he says, to tackle the dominant, exogenous communication theories and practices in telling our own story in our own unique ways. Wow, what a comment. One more question for you there, Prof. Let's get this in. Do you believe there are enough research facilities and resources available for Caribbean media, student, media students to embark on research initiatives? What are some of those we might have access to as young practitioners? Yeah, um, look, that's always gonna be an issue because we don't have the resources like some of the places do. I, I wouldn't want to tell you the number. I, I know the number. I wouldn't want to tell you the number, uh, the dollar number that passes through some of these big American universities in terms of research funding. I mean, we have nothing like it, and we're not likely to see anything like that in the, in the short or medium term. What it means is that we have to be creative. And we have to be clever about how we do the research. So when you talk about the facilities, so talk about the fact that we have archives that we can now digitize, that we can access from other territories. So, so let's say someone in Trinidad is doing research and they're researching like I was researching radio. You can learn about radio. Uh, there's two of my other books you guys didn't mention, but one of them is on, on mentions radio in the region. And literally by reading the Gleaner, I was able to figure out what was happening with radio in Trinidad because the Gleaner was reporting on it. Right, and this is back in the 1920s and 30s. So, if we're create, if, if if these tools are developed, if the archives and the digital connections and all these things are developed, and if we're creative about it, we can we can get a lot of mileage out of them. Uh, in addition, in addition, if we think about um, creative approaches to gathering data as well. So, you know, it's expensive to go out and do surveys. Sometimes we want to do surveys. If we start using the online tools, like some people have already started doing, if people are living their lives on, on the social media, we can research them on the social media. We can administer the surveys on social media. These are kind of the adaptations I was talking about. So what it is for us, since we're always in, in the short to medium, unless, unless one day we get really, really rich, I'm hoping that that happens, but mm -hmm. probably not in my lifetime. Um, we have to be creative about how we use the limited resources we have and we have to be uh, dedicated to conducting research and also creative activity so we are in a better place now than we were 30 years ago not only because caramac has grown and developed 
but they're doing great work down at St. Augustine as well. They're doing film. They're making films. They're making films down there at St. Augustine. So there's a lot happening and they're conducting research. I've, I had someone from the, not even from Com, from another faculty at St. Augustine get in touch with me about doing some research about, um, about certain movies in Trinidad and studying them based on the ads in the newspapers. So that sort of creativity, that sort of, and again, we, we come back to, I think what might be the central point, seeing ourselves as valid producers of history. I think there is nothing more important than that. That is the thing we need to start doing. When we see ourselves and our history as important, our research will be important. Our drive, our motivation to study that history, our motivation to investigate our societies, to examine our content, all of those things follow from understanding that we are the valid creators of our own history. Agri Brown had it right. It is the sum total of us and our environment, and we need to express it. I have a question here, um, Prof. I think you may have addressed it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It says, how do we deal with the loss of oral tradition and information known by the older persons in the region that may have never been written down once they pass on? I think your point was to talk to them before they do, no? Uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. You have to talk to them before they do, but there, there's some... There's some other ways about it as well. I mean, you you talk about the social networks, you know, so one of the things that we often do when we lose someone is to find out the people who knew them and we mm -hmm. interview. So, so in one of my books where I looked at um, uh, certain developments in radio, for example, um, a fellow by the name of, of Fessenden was one of these people who started off audio broadcasting. And Fessenden was an engineer and he did all of his work and stuff. Luckily, Fessenden's wife went with him out into the rocky outcrops on the coast, wherever they did the experiments, and she kept a diary. And so by, by looking at her diary, we were able to reconstruct parts of his life. Similarly, in Trinidad, there was a uh, Presbyterian missionary who went there. And in tracking down some of the stuff that he did while he was there, we could look at the people around him and stuff that they wrote, or if they're, you know, if it's, if it's more recent, people around them who have memories of those people. So it's, it's, it's not completely lost, but still there is a time factor because those people who knew them, you're going to lose them too. If you don't act on it, you're going to lose the people who knew the people you've lost. So we do need to act quickly. We do need to value that part of our history. We do need to see uh, these contributions as worthy and worthy while people are still alive to share them with us. Because let me tell you another thing, as an older person myself now, remember, I, I couldn't remember the name of our introductory concourse. We do start forgetting things as well. So that's another reason we need to work on this. Let, let us create our history while we can. Let us not mourn the passing of our history as we've done for so long. Yeah, excellent point, Prof. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for maybe two more. So let me, let me ask this one from Cass says, how do you decide what it is you want to research, especially if it's also for sitting uh, where topics are usually given to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 listen, listen. That's a really, really good question. So there's two answers. One of them is an answer for when you're young. When you're young and you're starting off in research and you're going up for tenure and you're doing all of these things, you do the research that is deemed important. And how do you know what's deemed important? Well. Back in the day when we were doing the HIV AIDS research, how do we know it was important? Well, because people were putting money into it. Um, people were mentioning it at conferences. So you, you sort of focus on, on, on the topical things, the things that will get you noticed. That's really good practical advice. When you get to be an old fuddy-duddy like me, and you have you know four books and you know journal articles published and all kinds of stuff, then you can do another thing, which I will admit to doing now, which is, I shouldn't say this to any young people, but wait till you get old like me. And then do stuff that's fun. Then do stuff that, that intrigues you, do stuff that fascinates you. Those things, because guess what? You've already done the groundwork. You've done 20 years of research, 25 years. You've already, you know how things work. <coughs> then you can start having those flights of fancy where you can do investigations of things that people maybe didn't think about investigating that you can take on as a hobby. But early on, early on, watch the agendas, watch the things that are 
uh, receiving attention in academia, receiving attention by governments and policymakers, do important and meaningful research. And I say this because I did research on HIV AIDS. I did research on how people deal with the disease. I did research on how people learn about the disease. And I don't know how much of a difference my research made, but maybe it made a little tiny bit of, of difference. And you know what? That's enough. If that's if that's what I got out of if if one person paid attention to the messages, if one person was maybe swayed, that's enough for me. And you know, in, in, in this life, there's only so much you can do. But do those important things. Do those things that are critical and socially valuable at the time when you are starting off. And later in life, when you, you know, you're nearing retirement like me, then do the fun stuff. Do the hard stuff, do the grunt stuff. And one of the things that you want to do in your in setting up the agenda because you know a lot of times that agenda is set by others like the hiv aids thing that money was coming from outside now we knew it was important we felt it was important too but there's sometimes when you know in your own community in your own country in your own region you will see things that need researching that need investigating and that requires a certain amount of courage where everyone else is looking at that thing and you're like, but these people have not had a voice. Like we, 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 we've not heard from this community why they're excluded from you know, the social matrix, why we don't hear from them online. I mean, that was a, actually a study that my daughter and I actually did is we, we, we studied people who were being marginalized when they showed up online and we asked ourselves, are they also being marginalized online? And you know, sometimes not everyone's doing that research but you look at it and you see there is something valuable. There is something worthwhile. And like we, like I've, I've said this evening, you know, where it has to do with making. And by the way, I don't want you to misinterpret the word history. I don't know if you know people like Simone and 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 Livingston who spent the time with Agri understood when he said the word history, it didn't mean this thing from the past in a book. That's never what it meant. He was trying to get to us that key message that it is about today it is about now and it's about how you inter interact and 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 negotiate your environment and your society and your reality now so I, I'll, I'll i'll repeat what i said make the damn history make the damn history wow i can't say damn and it's okay in this book <laughs> i said it so you know final question for you prof and this one is a generic one but it's very important what advice would you give to a young media practitioner? It's a tough time right now for media practitioners. We are seeing the, the business itself face many, many challenges. Here's the advice I would give to a young media practitioner. Believe in it. Believe in what you're doing. Believe that what you do. This is one of the lessons that Agri taught us. He taught us all in was it media and development? Was that the name of the course? Maybe it was, I don't know, maybe I'm off. But, but in, in the introductory courses, Agri would emphasize to us that these, and, and by the way, this is, this is stuff that was, you know, Wilbur Schramm and Ev Rogers had talked about these for years before. Agri was, and, and by the way, let me not seem too insular in this presentation. I, I have seemed very insular, but Agri was not insular in his thinking. Agri was heavily influenced by Wilbur Schramm. Agri was heavily influenced by Everett Rogers. When I first met Everett Rogers and he found out I was, I had studied under Agri Brown, he went nuts. He said, you gotta come study with me. Agri Brown is such a great guy. And he was really amazed by him, right? Um, but yeah, uh, Agri related to those ideas from people like Schramm and Rogers, when they talked about the media being tools of national development. Now that's something that's been used, you know, the wrong way by some people, but I still think that it's possible to believe that you can, by doing good media work, by keeping populations informed, someone was talking about, you know, the whole notion of disinformation, by fighting disinformation, by establishing truth and facts and you know setting up high standards of truth in your work you can make that difference so my advice would be to believe just believe that you can make a difference and you can use these tools make make some money yeah, yeah. i want you to be i want you to be comfortable i want you to have a good life doing the media stuff but also believe that there can be positive effects from what you do as a young media practitioner uh, I see Faye Ellington and, and Suzanne Francis-Brown on the chat. 
um, with an excellent point, um, saluting Earl Maxim, our journalist here in Jamaica, who is doing amazing work with archive, archival information. I mean, something happens and they can just, he has it at the tip of his fingers. It's right. game changing. And um, yes, Nancy Ferry wants to salute him, says, I must mention the invaluable work that RJ journalist Earl Maxim does with weaving archival material into topical issues and stories. This gives such context and provides historical perspective. I, I, I like that. I like that anti fear. I'd not heard that before, but really, really? that's how that's how it feels because I, every time I've met her, she's probably tired of me. Tell, every time I've met her, I told her about the fact that she was our auntie on TV. My my wife and I, young newlyweds just moving to Jamaica, knew nothing about the place. She was like our auntie on TV. She helped us settle there. She helped us live. She helped us learn. Uh, we owe her a debt of gratitude. Thank you, Auntie Faye. Everybody's, everybody's auntie. We all, claim, <laughs> <laughs> we all claim her as our family. Um, speaking of which, is Shana Mohammed related to you, Prof? Shana is yours? Ah, uh, yeah, that's my Shana, niece. Shana's in the chat. Shana. She's got, a, she's got a, a, a movie in production. That's one of them I was telling you, out of St. Augustine, who's, um, they're producing movies. I'm quite proud of them. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Shana's in the chat echoing her dad's sentiments in caps with three exclamation signs, no less. Make the damn history. Oh, Shana. now, wait, 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 there's two of them. There's a Sarah Mohammed and there's a Shana Mohammed, both are related. This is Shana, this is okay. Shana, mm -hmm. this is Shana. And reminder, as Prof said, the history is no. History is no, Absolutely. everybody. Um, once again, Prof, we express our sincere gratitude for you. Um, and to you for making this year's lecture another spectacular one. I'm sure the wisdom that you have shared tonight has added to our collective knowledge. And as we come to the end of this program, I'm going to invite Ganesha Ewers, finalizing Caramac student and the leader of the team of coordinators who you all will agree has done a fantastic job tonight to move, to move the vote of thanks. Ganesha. Thank you, Simone. <laughs> It has been a wonderful evening. Ladies and gentlemen, specially invited guests, a very great evening to you all. I am pleased to deliver the vote of thanks for this, the 12th annual Caramac Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture. On behalf of my team, the AgriGs, a group of final year integrated marketing communication students, who so ably planned and executed this event, I would like to extend gratitude to our remarkable guest speaker, Professor Shahid Nick Mohammed, for your informative and intriguing presentation, and to our excellent and captivating moderator, Ms. Simone Clark. Thank you for sparing your invaluable time to grace this event and aiding in its success. To our production teams at Caramac and Uemona Media, our sponsors, Digicel, Fontana Pharmacy, Sangsters Bookstores, Terry Cosmetics, Pathodia Gifts, and the Gift Curator, Caramac Content Creators, Guest Performers, Social Media Influencers, and our Event Ambassadors, thank you all for your exceptional service that displayed Caramac's greatness today. I must mention our sense of deep appreciation for Mrs. Susan Francis Brown, Dr. Livingston White, and Dr. Alpha Abika for your valuable contribution to this lecture. Finally, to you, our beloved audience, thank you for your support and engagement in the chat. Certainly, this event could not have been the same without you. As Professor Shahid said, make the damn history once again thank you all <laughs> dr dr white i feel you're going to be hearing that in the halls of caramac for a while to come your students are just going to be walking around charging each other to make the make that history damn it make the damn history um what a great takeaway for us for um this evening i am so proud of you glenisha and team you know, I sit just watching you folks execute and I feel like I want to burst with pride because, you know, it, it just, it, the output has been so professional. It reminds me of Livingston of our days on campus when oh, yeah. we never quite had to do it this way, but we're in the TV studio putting yeah. on outputs. And just to know that that legacy lives on is just so heartening to me. I can only imagine how you must feel. As we the head of the organization. 
you know, we are happy that we've been able to sustain it as part of the curriculum, you know, and uh, the students are able to carry on these various final year projects uh, from year to year. So we're quite pleased with that. And it's so a feature proud. that we plan to keep in the curriculum. Absolutely. Call on me anytime. Happy to have been a part of it. Honored to have been a part of it. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this experience. Before we go, let me say... Congratulations to our giveaway winners for this evening. Question one, Cecilia McCain, you are the winner. These folks will get in touch with you and tell you what you've won from the sponsors. Amari Campbell, you won our second giveaway. And Natalie Wright Njotu, I hope I said that right, you are the winner of our third giveaway for tonight. Before we leave, I'm gonna ask you all to kindly fill out the post evaluation survey as it will assist the coordinators of the event in their assessment. The first two persons who complete the post-evaluation form are gonna win for yourselves $200 in core credit each. So go get it. And as our final item comes to us, let's remember the lesson brought to us by Professor Shaheed Mohammed. Let's continue to honor the legacy of Professor Agri Brown by embodying the excellence that is Karamak in our work. That's a charge that we leave everybody um, on, this, on this Zoom meeting with today. And Prof, you are an outstanding example of what this school has, has given to the world, to the region and to the world. So thank you everybody. We've come to the end of the 12th annual staging of the Karamak Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen all, thank you again for being here. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And we wish for you a wonderful rest of evening. Take care, everybody.